Hi, everyone. Good afternoon here in Ontario. Good morning in Perks West. Hopefully everybody can see my slides and hear me okay. All right. Um, so I'm very happy to be working with Hiroko today to present the second webinar. I do want to acknowledge that I'm uh, joining you from the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Lenequek and Chinookan nations in what is now called London, Ontario, and Hiroko is joining from the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta, and we pay our respects to elders past and present. So today's webinar is really focused on how we bring trauma and violence informed approaches into financial literacy education. Um, you will see me talk a little bit about service interactions as well as educational interactions. Sometimes I slip and use the word trauma and violence informed care because that's the way we talk about it in, in healthcare settings. Um, but really it is about starting to get to those practical strategies. What I'm going to do is just give a quick, and I'm, I apologize ahead of time, probably too quick recap of what we did in our last webinar, which is really setting out the principles of a trauma and violence informed approach um, and you know why we, we bring them be into this work. I always start by addressing the fact that this is not easy work. Um, you know, we are struggling, you know, as Rebecca said, coming out of a, a global pandemic with increased rates of moral distress in our own lives and our own service and educational practice. Um, we might find that inequities are increasing. As Rebecca mentioned, I, I work in the area of violence against women, and we know that domestic violence and, and violence in the home increased um, because of various stressors. Uh, and, you know, this, this can do harm um, to us as, as providers, as researchers, as members of the public. So we do want to acknowledge um, the potential for moral distress. And the point I want to add here that I didn't emphasize last time was it's not easy to discuss these issues. And as we work through this content, um, you might be thinking of things in new ways, and this might be upsetting and distressing, and we certainly invite you to take a break if, if you need to, but also to embrace this disruption, because as I always say, if nothing changes, nothing changes. So we really do want to have the good kind of disruption, the kind of disruption that makes us reflect um, and with support from our peers and our managers and our organizations to actually do things um, in a more trauma and violence informed way to better serve um, those that we're educating. So here are a few of the key points. And again, the, the recording for, for webinar one, for all of our webinars will soon be available. So if you weren't able to attend, um, please, you know, you, you can access that and get more detail. And I'll also provide you with links to resources um, to some of our online tools. But some of the key points, Trauma is everywhere in our society. And as I mentioned last time, at least three quarters of Canadians have directly experienced traumatic events that would meet the threshold for post-traumatic stress disorders. Um, and if you haven't directly experienced it, you've experienced it via your relationships. Um, so it is prevalent, which argues for a universal approach to thinking about how to create safety for people in various types of interactions. And trauma presents differently for different people and actually it can present differently from the same person in different circumstances. And we talked a little bit about sort of fight, flight, freeze and fawn. And this does depend on various factors, including how much, um, how many protective factors you have in your social environment, for example. We emphasize, uh, and again, this is getting at the B in trauma and violence informed approaches that interpersonal forms of violence, like domestic violence, like um, maltreatment when you're a child, like elder abuse, are particularly complex and chronic forms of trauma because they're usually chronic, they're repeated, they happen over and over again, and they break our ability to form attachments, or they can do that. And I do always want to emphasize that many people survive and thrive um, very serious forms of trauma. Um, and it is a constellation of factors that will decide or um, you know, have, a, have um, a say in how you might be responding to trauma. But these forms of violence, interpersonal forms of violence are particularly pernicious, let's say. And our trauma responses are in large part physiological. So there, there are changes in your brain chemistry and changes in your body so that when you see somebody in an educational context or in a practice setting, and you see a response like fight, 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 flight, freeze, or fawn, that is a physiological response. And hopefully that can help us be less judgmental and more empathetic and compassionate. And the V, importantly for us, and, and we've done research in this area for decades now, brings attention to forms of structural violence. And what we mean by this is forms of stigma, discrimination, collective and historical violence, including things like um, colonialism and the experiences of our Indigenous people um, throughout Canadian history, 
such that these are everyday forms of trauma that impact our well-being. So not only have we maybe experienced traumatic events in the past, and these might be repeated, but we might be experiencing ongoing conditions that are structured into our society and into our policies that make life more difficult for certain people. And these sorts of experiences might lead those in service contexts to have particular biases or stereotypes or negative attitudes. And we're really trying to get at those things, both at the individual provider level, but also in our, our protocols, our policies, the way we make decisions as organizations or as education delivering programs, et cetera, to you know, get rid of those um, biases and stereotypes and make people's experiences more positive and effective. And that's important because we want our education to be effective, for example. One of the questions that came up in the chat at the last webinar was a concern that sometimes it doesn't seem fair to give some people more than you give other people in terms of your attention, in terms of resources and your programming and so on. So many of you have probably seen a version of this tree diagram that you know, basically um, the current reality is that some people have very little access to the resources they need. So on the left side of, of the left tree, um, not only do those folks, are, they're not able to reach the branches, but there are no apples on that side of the tree. And other people have very good access um, to lots of apples and they might not even need that many apples. An equality approach would mean giving everybody the same thing. But if there's nothing on that side of the tree, you're still not getting an apple. Okay, so this is the fundamental difference between a, an approach that is equal, where everybody gets the same thing, to an approach that is based on equity, where people get what they need with the intention that the outcomes will start to be more similar. So that is how we reduce inequities. And the important link here to, to our work is that trauma and violence informed approaches, or here I've said care, are a component of what we call equity oriented care. And those also include focusing on harm reduction and substance use health, but especially stigma and an anti-racist culturally safe lens. So what does that mean? Oops, sorry. Um, it means being culturally safe doesn't mean learning about people's cultures and how they celebrate and what they eat and so on. It really means focusing on how these forms of discrimination based on race and ethnicity and so on shape people's experiences of service. And as with all of our TBI principles, we start with challenging organizations to examine where those biases might be operating and to create safety, which is what we're going to talk about today, um, so that our, our services are respectful and welcoming to everyone who comes in the door. And that does involve authentic partnerships with people who are experiencing racism or leaders from groups that are experiencing racism in this case. And it really is about power. Everything's about power, as I always tell my students. Focusing on stigma, um, and again, in our work, we've looked at, particularly at substance use stigma as a really nasty form of stigma and judgment. Um, but as I thought about this and some of the situations you might find yourselves in as educators, really the stigma can be pervasive around mental health issues, around poverty, et cetera. And it, it, it crosses multiple levels. People have self-stigma. They believe they're not deserving. Um, because of their own experiences. And then stigma uh, is interpersonal and also baked in again to our systems and protocols and policies. So in terms of substances, it's, it's quite um, interesting. Most Canadians use some sort of substance, but some substances and some people are stigmatized more than others. And the interaction of certain people using certain substances is highly stigmatized. So the harm is in the stigma and how we respond um, to people using substances. And I think that's important as we maybe consider some of the strategies in terms of a trauma and violence informed approach. And a point here is that we wanna meet people where they're at, um, such that we're able to provide safe service for them while balancing the needs of our broader group. And, and this might come out in group-based scenarios, for example, when we're doing education sessions. So going from trauma-informed to trauma and violence informed really brings in this more structural lens and focuses us beyond sort of what happened to people in the past or what's wrong in their heads and what is still happening um, and how we contribute to that collectively as a society, but also as organizations and individual providers. Um, I think it helps us really understand that some of what we see in people's responses are physiological and we can anticipate them. Not everyone will respond a certain way, but when we see it, we should switch to compassion and not to judgment. 
And again, bringing attention to the complexity of certain forms of violence. Um, and I would say in your practice, if you're dealing with women who are living on low incomes, um, certainly violence in the home might be a factor that you'd want to consider. So understanding that as a particular form of trauma. So our TBI principles are quite simple. We've got four of them here, um, and we try to emphasize, you know, the focus on structural and systemic violence and then actively countering discrimination and stigma. Today, um, we're going to go through the first two principles. In the next webinar, we'll focus more on principles three and four, um, but really understanding trauma and violence and how it impacts people's lives and behavior and strategies at the organizational and individual level to create um, emotional, cultural, and physical safety for everybody in the environment. So I think that's another important point I made last time. We want providers to feel safe and well in those interactions and understand that repeatedly hearing people's traumatic experiences and maybe the really challenging conditions in which they live can take a toll on providers, on educators, and we really need to keep um, those folks safe as well. So our first principle, has strategies at the organizational and provider level. I'm not going to read this entire slide because Hiroko is going to actually give us some really good grounded in, in financial literacy examples. And our second principle also grounded in organizational and provider practices and really reinforcing the fact that as a provider, if your organization or as an educator, if your program is not supporting you to practice in these ways, a, you won't be able to do it um, or as effectively as you could, and B, it does lead to that moral distress and that feeling of mismatch between your values and how you know you need to practice and what you're able to do. So always the onus on organizations um, to create the environment for um, safe spaces and safe interactions to happen. So I'm going to turn it to Hiroko, and I think I actually stayed to my 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nadine. This is like an um, amazing opportunity uh, for having me here today at webinar number two. Um, everyone, um, my name is Hiroko Nakao and I'm Financial Empowerment Department Manager at Momentum. And um, yeah, just a, this is an exciting uh, topic uh, to be able to share uh, what I have done for the last seven years and also um, how Momentum approach to financial empowerment work and also supporting vulnerable populations through our work. Next slide, please. Yes, just a, a little bit about us. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization over 30 years in Calgary, Alberta. We, um, uh, overarching our goal is to reduce poverty through uh, uh, economic development uh, sort of approach, uh, one of which is financial empowerment. Our vision is to um, everyone um, has a sustainable livelihood uh, and a contribute to their economy. And our mission is we work with the people living on lower incomes and a partner in our community to create the thriving local economy for all. Next slide, please. And um, so I just wanted to um, share financial literacy topic is um, in our organization over 20 years practicing. So uh, for us, it's uh, very much straightforward and we are all passionate about delivering this uh, workshops and programs in relation to financial literacy. Um, uh, our department called financial literacy in the past, and recently we changed our name to financial empowerment. That is more speak how we deliver our work. So um, in this slide, uh, 2009, um, the government of Canada uh, sort of like a form the task force to what is a financial literacy? And I often um, share this phrase with our participant. It really speaks about what is a financial literacy, not only talk about uh, managing money, but it's more like uh, build our knowledge, skills, and confident to make responsible financial de decisions. So I wanted to focus on confident. Um, this is a really key word. Um, oftentimes people who come into uh, our programs, uh, as you can imagine, uh, chronic poverty, um, coming from overseas and um, living uh, on like a small incomes, survival job to survival jobs. And confidence will be um, highly damaged interrupted. Um, so this is a very, very key factor 
for our work to promote the confidence so that people can start making their own decision with confidence. So this is something that we uh, talk about. Financial literacy, financial management is not only how much we make money. It is more like how we perceive our money in a way that we control our life. It is our all responsibilities and also our rights to see where the money is going and then we make a sound decisions. So this is a really a key factor that um, often people start thinking like, oh, Hiroko, I thought it's like, you're gonna tell me how to calculate money. No, we're gonna talk about uh, relationship with money. How do you feel about money? How do you want to feel my, your money or money management in the future going forward? So that's the a little bit different approach in terms of uh, budgeting, banking, credit, debt management, asset building, and, and consumerism that we talk about is all ties to how we feel confident, how we feel good about ourselves. Next slide, please. So momentum is um, uh, embracing this uh, principle. It's called adult learning principles. Uh, most of the uh, programs are tailored to adult 18 years and up. Uh, some of them are uh, youth program that we offer as well. However, uh, this adult prin uh, learning principle and how we learn things or new things or we learn um, things that we already learn. In the learning uh, environment, we feel respected. So Nadine has uh, mentioned about marginalization could be a discrimination racially, socioeconomically. Um, I see from my uh, eyes and felt a lot of people feel, um, again, mind, marginalized, and especially money talk is disrespected or not respected. It's not my topic to talk about because I'm not making enough money. Um, I worked with uh, women uh, fled from domestic violence. Uh, living on, uh, for a long time, financial abuse. Uh, those people uh, never felt any stronger to be able to talk about money or don't even know about the concept about money for themselves. And also um, wealth of knowledge. We all say um, there is some skills and knowledge that we picked up through our life. No matter where they're coming from, how the life is being. We all have some skills and knowledge to be here today. So we celebrate uh, whatever that uh, life that they um, you know, uh, went through and then uh, be in a learning environment that itself is a celebration. So we acknowledge that. And also uh, adult response very well with applicability. So something that uh, relevant to their life. And also we um, often kind of talk about, there is a different learning styles. It doesn't have to be sitting still. And oftentimes people who have PTSD, ADHD, uh, mental health, those people cannot uh, focus very well. So we upfront about uh, what would be helpful for you to learn better. It could be tapping on the desks or some people get up and walk around. And we all talk about opening about what would help you. So um, those are the really important uh, things to keep in mind, how we wanted to learn new skills and knowledge and um, what would be the most accommodation that we can provide as well. Next slide, please. So um, just to having that very basic sort of principles, and then uh, we wanted to just uh, dive right into actually how we can create safe and um, sort of a positive learning space in terms of recognizing trauma and also violence, some form of disruption in their life. So um, here is a create a safe and positive space that um, we keep in mind. So effective learning environment. 
what it means is that um so how is the environment looks like when they come to meeting space for coaching or group learning um we often like kind of make a little bit more cleaner um uh, visual wise is dis disruptive so taking down too many like posters or a little bit more simple so that uh, they can more focus on to learning and some uh, partner organization uh, especially second stage uh, shelter organizations uh, sometimes is uh, kind of play the music really enthusiastic music um, so that might be a little bit calming um, uh, effect as well and then of course create the welcoming non-judgmental and inclusive atmosphere so this could be uh, create physically but also uh, we can talk about what that mean by welcoming to them so I often like invite uh, participants to have sort of like a class norms uh, what is a non-judgmental really mean to them because their non-judgmental means and my judgmental means may not be the same. And so that will be a great introduction to start talking about uh, what does that mean by inclusive. And um, when I used to deliver uh, financial literacy workshops to um, uh, sort of like organizations that working with uh, ex-sex workers, and um, um, they are very knowledgeable about how they want to uh, set up the class to be and how they want to share uh, their stories. Um, they wanted to go around uh, emotional checkup. They wanted to use third person's uh, um, sort of names so that they don't have to disclose themselves. So we can openly talk about that and acknowledge participant challenge. I often do this um, quite regularly each classes and also financial coaching setting as well. Our life is full of challenge and it's so uh, predictable to have ups and downs. So they really, what we wanted to do is how we can prepare down and how do we recognize when we go back up. So challenge is the opportunities. So we uh, try to create atmosphere to welcome challenge. So it's a little bit interesting approach to it. And um, also like, uh, what do you hope to achieve? Um, I often invite participants to, um, what do you want to learn today? I have a stack of like a module but um, I will invite them to uh, let them know. So that's the kind of power dynamic that we wanted to pro uh, sort of promote as well. Um, I'm just a facilitator and then they're the participant that we call participants uh, instead of client. And I'm facilitating your learning, but you are the here to learn. So let us know what's the most important for you today. Um, and also prior to the workshop, I often call one uh, one person at a time, introduce myself and upfront about this is how it's going and how many people sh will be in the class. Um, it could be gender dynamic as well. And um, um, ask about uh, what is concerning to you? Um, how can I make uh, your learning to be um, more smooth and comfortable? And is there any break that you wanted to have? So, and also like money uh, topics can trigger a um, lot of historical um, sort of incident, uh, traumatic, traumatic uh, sort of event. So I will kind of op often talk about, you know, like sometimes the money topics can bring up your histories or stories. And can you let me know, or how can I assist you if that bring up during the class. You're more than welcome to uh, stand up quietly and then go outside, walk around, come back, or you can just write it down on a piece of paper and then just hand it over to me. So um, I just uh, kind of really open and honest about what might happen. So uh, trauma head is really predictability is important. So I will give a lot of assurance 
lots of predictable uh, future, what they up against, um, it usually works well. And also they start empowered to be able to say, hey, you know what, banking topic is really triggering to me. Because lost lots of time, I went through a bad experiences bank, and also my uh, pen poor, like you know, a uh, partner held a credit card or uh, seized my account. And so, all of that, those kind of conversation or engagement with participant create sort of a sense of trust between participant and us. And also during the class, we can openly talk about those things and other people start feeling, oh, it is okay to feel this way. And money does trigger family violence and so on. So um, I do uh, lots of listening, assurance, normalization, and validation. And it often say it is okay not to be okay today. So um, those kind of things are really, seems to be nothing of, nothing to do with financial literacy, but uh, to me, it's very much everything to do with how we perceive and feel about money. So this is a big tip from me for the practice that I, I have done in the past seven years. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So the uh, next five, uh, six minutes, is a little bit of uh, sort of tips that I like to share. Um, so in this slide, I said, uh, when to introduce the topics that are related to mental health and addiction. Um, so my sort of program that I led was uh, mainly for people uh, with mental health and addiction challenges, uh, oftentimes people recovery phase. And those people are not only having mental health and addictions, lots of trauma, lots of um, childhood abuse, um, lots of poverty, and um, full of um, unfortunate stories bringing up and coming out. And um, more we normalize those challenges and incidents related to financial matters, um, can be uh, really kind of helping them to start more conceptualize and objectify what was happening in their past life and also start making a dot together. Oh, why I feel this way today was perhaps when I bringing up in a childhood, there was a kind of family a breakdown, uh, family violence, or maybe because my ex uh, significant others treat me this way through because of the uh, situation, oftentimes uh, financial situation um, somewhat related, could be indirectly, uh, invisibly, but uh, directly in a very visible way. So there is no perfect time. Again, trust building really help both of us to bring up this type of uh, very hard conversation. Then again, being able to share how the conversation is a very beginning of the healing and recovery journey. Because now we start accepting what happened in the past and then what we are doing is connecting a dot. So be open to talk about money management challenge. It is everybody says, yes, it is a challenging. And again, let the, I often say, you don't have to say, this is my story. You can say my neighbor, you can say my friend and provide overview of the workshop. This is again, create the product, uh, predictability of the workshops and then what we kind of uh, uh, going through of the day. Next slide, please. Yeah, so engagement, uh, it's all about engagement and that uh, disclosure happens. And um, uh, often say, uh, if you have something that you wanted to disclose or happen to disclose, um, there is a normalization, but also empowering as well. What you have um, shared with us 
is an amazing opportunity for everyone as well. And then do lots of um, sort of off the class uh, or after class sort of engagement. Co-develop personal plan. This means that a learning plan and if something happened to them, safety plan, what can I do to help you? Some people just cry all of a sudden um, or, you know, just the coming incident that happened. How can I help you? So again, create the productivity, uh, predictability, and acknowledge challenges and success. So those are things are really simple, but when you are in the moment, um, become really a challenge in things uh, for us as well. So how to manage those moments in a ways that everybody feel empowered. Next slide, please. So this is like a kind of last slide for me. Uh, consideration. So um, provider is us, organization and the facilitators. We feel needs to be empowered and confident. And so that we kind of like accommodate and deal with a very challenging situation that all of a sudden come up during the class. So intentionally uh, situate the learning space. So where is your door? How are you going to shape your kind of classroom or even financial coaching? And is there anybody is around you? So in case uh, distress happens, can you just go get somebody really quickly? And also like evening workshops, maybe like situate close to the reception. And everybody is also knows that people around. So not only yourself, but also a participant as well. And um, helpful training for facilitators. Uh, our organization just offered sort of the escalation, um, employment coaching training. Um, many of us are social work background as well. And um, so um, it will be kind of nice to have nominate some people that are really kind of equipped to do the escalation. Um, Sometimes people going through a very hard time, like uh, trauma or chronic poverty, uh, can bring up some anger as well. Not to you, but it could be a life or it could be a system. So how can we create, uh, maintain safe environment for everyone, including yourself? And lastly, create the culture of a reflective and a supportive practice. So this is a really key component, how we can uh, debrief within the team. Um, we are open door policy. We have a full of like uh, amazing facilitators. So we always checking each other, um, something that happened, um, managers and uh, coordinators available and also peer facilitators available. And uh, learning coordinator uh, often uh, create a learning opportunities in circles as well. So those are something that might be uh, integrated into your uh, organizational practice as well. And also lastly, code of conduct that Momentum has every uh, like a classrooms, uh, what is the respective uh, learning uh, environment, um, how if you have wanted to uh, share some concerns, uh, this is the procedure that they can follow as well. So something to perhaps think about integrating into your organizational practice as well. So um, I will hand it over back to you, Nadine. Thanks, Hiro. It's just so wonderful to hear the strategies you've used and how well they uh, align with a TVI approach. People often ask, but where do I start? How do I actually start thinking about doing uh, what I do in a more TVI way? So I'm just gonna go very quickly through a couple of slides because I know we wanna leave some time for questions. Start by examining your language and the words that you use. So I've got a few examples here of, you know, first of all, starting with person first language because you don't wanna stigmatize or label people. So instead of saying an abused woman or a battered woman, you might say a woman experiencing violence which also gives the sense that that can change. That's a situation that she's in, it's not her identity. Convey optimism and give hope. So I think we have in the gender-based violence field sort of switched our language from victim to survivor because that's a more hopeful term. Um, and really think about how you're talking about the person's choices. 
Um, they are the expert in their own life. And um, using language that reflects that is a trauma and violence informed approach. So she might be choosing a path that is not the path that you think she should be on, um, but rather than saying she's non-compliant, respect the fact that she's choosing a different path. And again, as Hiroko said, normalizing and, and reframing those responses to trauma um, and thinking about people's strengths and being future oriented. So at the bottom there, I have a little bit of text. So thank you, you thank people for sharing. It took a lot of courage. Nobody deserves to be treated that way. Your reaction is understandable. How can I help? What's our next step together? A really good thing um, in terms of getting started is examining your organization and your, and your setting. So Soroko says, you're setting up a safe learning environment or a safe um, you know, facilitation environment. We have something called a trauma review exercise. It's at our incubator website um, on the left there. Uh, and you can go through this on your own and you can then go through it with your team, with your colleagues, and importantly with people who use your service or take your education. And that will really give you some insights as to what needs and, and can change right away to make those uh, spaces and interactions more safe. In our equipped suite of tools, we also um, have strategies to guide organizations. So that's uh, one of our discussion tools. And again, the URL is at the bottom and we will be um, sharing the slide deck. And finally, as we um, both Heroku and I talked about, taking care of staff is really important. So as an organization, um, we have a vicarious trauma tool, the, the URL at the bottom here, um, but you really wanna make sure that staff are aware of what might be happening to them. Um, if staff want debriefing, either formal or informal, and as Heroku said, a reflective supervision environment, that can be very helpful knowing that that support is there. Um, ideally, employee assistance programs that help people with counseling expenses and so on, and organizational supports for self-care. Um, so those are some ways that we can think very um, specifically about supporting staff well-being. And that's all, all we've got in terms of slides. I've got our um, contact information there.